Now that we can draw motion diagrams to represent the position that an object has at equal points in time, we now want to take those motion diagrams that are really just representing those positions and try and add vectors in that can also tell us some information about what the velocity is doing and what the acceleration is doing. Because as we're going to see, this velocity and acceleration are just as important to understanding an object's motion. So we're going to first use a lot of the skills that we already saw in our previous lesson to draw these motion diagrams out. And then we're going to just draw some basic vectors to represent what the velocity and acceleration are doing. But we don't have to draw them perfectly to scale. We just have to draw them well enough so we can see how they relate to one another. So in our first example, we've got a sprinter that accelerates from rest at the start of a race. So we start by just drawing a motion diagram of what's going on. Now, if they're accelerating from rest, that means they're stationary or they're not moving at the start, and they're increasing their speed from there. Well, we saw when that happens in our previous lesson, that means the dot should be spreading farther apart. So the first dot I'm going to draw will be only a small distance away from the second one, but the next one's going to be farther, then even farther, then farther, and then quite far away at the end. And then I'm actually going to redraw that exact same motion diagram under the acceleration spot as well, because I'm going to use a separate diagram to add my acceleration vectors on, so that I don't have to overload all one diagram. I can show separate diagrams for the two different kinds of vectors. Now if I look at velocity first, the idea is that it's accelerating, and that literally means your velocity is increasing. And so if your velocity is increasing, that means the length of your velocity vector should be growing. So in the first case, we're just going to draw a small vector that represents that velocity in the first second or so, the average velocity over that first second. But the average velocity over the second second is going to be larger. And over the third second, it'll be even larger than that. Over the fourth, even larger. And in the last one, that should be the largest of all. And to be a bit more specific, we'll label these and say that's V1, the, the average velocity in that first second, or first point in time. And we'll call the others accordingly, V2, V3, V4, and V5. And that's about as far as we can extend our diagrams at this point. But we have to be very careful when we think about the acceleration. Because the velocity is increasing the whole way along, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the acceleration is changing at all. And in this case, we're going to assume, which is roughly true in reality, that the sprinter is accelerating at a constant rate. It's often true in real life that things don't accelerate perfectly at a constant rate, but things often do accelerate or even decelerate at that matter at a fairly constant or steady rate. And so it's a very good approximation to use that concept in a lot of different problems. And we're going to see a lot of different problems that use this concept of constant acceleration. In vector form, though, that tells us something specific. If our acceleration is constant, that means it's not changing. In other words, the amount of acceleration, or in other words, the length of our vector, should be the same the entire way along. So while this printer moves forward, they also accelerate forwards. So I can draw a small blue arrow there to represent the acceleration rate. And I'm just going to call that A. I'm not even going to call it A1, and I'll explain that in just a second. At our next point in time, it is still going to be accelerating forwards, but the amount that it's accelerating is still the same. The acceleration rate didn't grow, just the velocity itself grew. The speed that the runner was moving at grew, but the rate that they are increasing that velocity stayed the same. And so I'm actually going to draw an arrow, as you can see, that's about the same size as the first. And in case it's not exactly the same, I'm going to label it with the exact same label as the first one. They are both just A. I'm not calling them A1 or A2 because there are no differences between them. A is the same the entire way along. At each second in time, 
we should have a vector that is about the same length. All simply called A. And this is the really important thing to remember, that velocity changing does not necessarily mean that acceleration is changing. And this is the perfect example where something is accelerating at a constant rate and we see the velocity change while the acceleration stays constant. A little more mathematically, and this is roughly true in our diagram, but doesn't have to be perfectly true when you draw this out. But in reality, what's happening is if we add A to V1, add, in other words, add your acceleration to your initial velocity, you get V2. And so on, and by that I mean once you have V2, add that same A value, that same A vector to V2, and that will give you V3. Then add that same A vector onto V3 to get V4, and so on. So that's essentially the pattern that we're noticing and how acceleration and velocity relate to one another. And if this diagram method is not making as much sense to you, we'll see this mathematically through lots of examples. But the key is, as you can see in your note, we need to notice that the velocity is continuing to grow while the acceleration stays the same. In our second example, there's a lot that this will have in common, but it's kind of going to work out to be an opposite example in reality. We're going to do the same thing, though. We're going to create a motion diagram with velocity vectors on it. So that's just my short form for velocity. And then we're going to make an identical motion diagram, but put acceleration vectors on it. So now we've got an ice skater that's going along at some speed, but then eventually comes to a stop. So this is the opposite situation that we had with acceleration. We're decelerating, which we can also, as we'll see, call a negative acceleration. So instead of all of the dots getting farther and farther apart as we cover more and more ground, the dots are going to get closer and closer together because you'll cover less and less ground or less and less ice as each second goes by while you're slowing down. But again, if I draw a single dot to represent where the ice skater is to start, they're moving along at some velocity, so maybe the next one is a certain distance away. But the key is the very next one from there should be a bit closer. The next one should be even closer, and so on. Now really, the last bunch would get very, very, very close together and you'd have a bunch that are essentially overlapping one another. But just so I don't crowd the diagram too much, it's enough just to show those basic points. Now I'm going to just redraw that exact same motion diagram underneath so that I have something that I can add some acceleration vectors onto as well. The velocity then, at first, is a fairly large vector. V1 would, should be the largest. V2, or the average velocity over the second point in time, is going to be smaller than that. V3 gets even smaller. V4, V5, and I'm not even going to draw one in for V6, but by the time we get to this final one, we are completely stopped. Now, what's happening with the acceleration in this case? Well, again, we're going to assume that the rate of acceleration is constant. 
And I keep using the word acceleration, but really, in our more common language, we would call this deceleration, slowing down. But in physics, what we see is that a deceleration, we can think of mathematically as just a negative acceleration. Remember, acceleration is just a change in velocity divided by time. So a negative acceleration just means you're negatively changing your velocity as time goes on. So that just means you're decreasing your velocity. And that's what we see happen here. But a negative vector, we also have seen, means a vector that points in the exact opposite direction. So if all of these blue velocity vectors were positive, and they all point straight to the right, my acceleration vectors should actually point straight to the left. That's what causes something to slow down. Anytime your acceleration vector goes in the exact opposite direction as your velocity vector. And again, I'm just going to call this A. So it's in the opposite direction, meaning it's a deceleration. But it's still a constant rate of that. So all of my deceleration vectors, or in other words, my negative acceleration vectors, should all be about the same size. So I'm drawing them all fairly small. And we are clearly decelerating because our acceleration is in the opposite direction to our velocity. third example that involves a car accelerating from rest and then slowing back down to a stop, that's kind of a combination of the first two examples that we've done. So I want you to actually try that on your own first, and then we'll take up any issues with that later on in class. What I'm going to do is jump actually just to example four, which is a little bit different now because it's representing a situation where the acceleration is occurring in a vertical direction. And it's also going to allow us to put some sp specific numbers onto this as well, instead of just looking at the diagrams and the vectors. We're going to still start by drawing the diagrams and the vectors that go with them. So you want quite a bit of space for this, as much as you can use on the page. And on one side, I'm going to put my velocity diagrams. On the other side, I'm going to put my acceleration vector diagrams. But remember, the motion that actually goes along with these is exactly the same. So I should draw identical motion diagrams on both sides. So the skydiver starts way up at the top. Give yourself as much space as possible. And then, when you are falling, you're under the influence of gravity. And gravity, as we saw with our car rolling down the hill in the previous note, that causes things to accelerate. And so our skydiver, maybe one second later, is about that far away. But then after the next point in time, they are much farther away. In the last case, they're even farther away. And I'm going to draw an identical motion diagram on the other side. And as before, we can draw in our velocity vectors. So that first one is v1, v2 should be longer than that, v3 even longer, and v4, even though I'm kind of running out of room, will be the longest one of all which even though I ran out of room a little bit, you can still see that it's longer than the others. As I said, we can actually be a bit more specific in terms of numbers. But before we do that, we should talk a little bit about the acceleration. Because this is a perfect case where acceleration would be constant. You are accelerating because of gravity. And gravity here on Earth always tends to make things accelerate at a fairly constant rate. Not exactly constant, because it still depends on some detailed factors, but 
almost always, gravity will try and make you accelerate at a specific rate of what we call 9.8 meters per second squared. Specifically, though, whoopsie, that one was too long. So all of your green arrows, just like we've seen before, shouldn't increase in length at all. They should all be roughly the same size. Because as I just said, gravity is always trying to make you accelerate at a constant rate, specifically a constant rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. I'm also going to make the assumption like we normally do that the upward direction is positive. And so if gravity is actually making you accelerate downwards, then we're going to call that negative 9.8 meters per second squared. But then, at our next point in time, the acceleration rate is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared. That's what we mean by a constant acceleration rate. In the third moment in time, the acceleration rate is still negative 9.8 meters per second squared and so on. At every point in time, gravity is always trying to make you accelerate at the same rate. Now that we have that in our back pocket, we can go back and look at velocity in a little bit more detail. So if something started from rest, if the skydive, skydiver started from rest in terms of their fall out of the airplane, that would be starting from zero velocity. And then they start accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared in the downwards direction. Well, what that literally means is that for every one second that goes by, you will have accelerated by 9.8 meters per second. And so if each of these dots represents a different moment in time, specifically a second in time, then your velocity after one second will be negative 9.8 meters per second. That negative, again, just means that it's in the downwards direction, the opposite to what I've called positive. So you accelerate for one second at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. And that means after one second, you are going at 9.8 meters per second down, or negative 9.8 meters per second. But then another second goes by, and that makes you continue to accelerate, or it increases your speed by another 9.8 meters per second. And so you're still going in the downward direction, so you still have a negative velocity, but now you've gone 9.8 meters per second and then another 9.8 meters per second. So you're actually going at negative 19.6 meters per second. And you can kind of get the pattern now. By that third moment in time, you're going at negative 29.4 meters per second, and that pattern just continues all the way down. And we could continue with V4 if you want to, and if you want to in your notes, you can. You could really do this well beyond V4 as well, and just continuing with every second that goes by, adding an additional 9.8 meters per second of speed. But really, it's like adding an additional negative 9.8 meters per second of speed because you're going in the negative direction as you fall. So again, in class, we will take up example three in a lot more detail. And I'll also leave the question at the bottom of the page for you to think about as well. So we can talk about that in a bit more detail in class, whether or not something that is that has a negative acceleration could be speeding up